We have traveled to well over a hundred countries, but we have never been to or even seen anywhere like the Mangostau Desert in Kazakhstan. Navigating this area was a real challenge, and once we arrived, we were quite literally blown away by just how vast and wild it was. We're a family of four on a five-year overlanding journey around the world. This is Jane, our grenadier, and we live here in our off-road trailer. Join us as we explore the far corners of our wild earth. We had come a long way from London. After nearly a year on the road, up through Scandinavia, down through the Balkans, across Turkey, and then Georgia, it was time to head to Central Asia. Due to the current visa situation with Russia for UK and US citizens, it was a bit tricky, but we came up with a solution that worked for us. The kids and I skipped Russia and flew overnight from Georgia to Kazakhstan, where we waited for Matt to drive through Russia with the car and trailer. Into Kazakhstan and a very happy man. The sun is out and it just feels a lot lighter here. And mission complete from a Russia perspective. The Mangostau Desert is in the southwest of Kazakhstan and there are two ways to get there. One is down a main road and the other is a shortcut through the Kazakh steppe. Guess which one we chose. More than 50% of the land in Kazakhstan is part of the Kazakh steppe that you can see here, a dry grassy plain. It was an endless sea of nothing but grass and shrubs as far as the eyes could see. It's hard to explain what that feels like, but maybe similar to when you get far out at sea and you can't see the land anymore. Now, there's a reason we didn't see anyone else on this track in the few days it took us to drive through. There are no other settlements around, no phone signal, and no fuel stations. Also, there had been quite a lot of rain right before we arrived, so we risked it being too muddy and either getting stuck or having to turn around for the longer route. We had a few slippery encounters with the clay-like mud, but mostly Matt just had fun driving through the muddy puddles. The crossroads that created deep rivets in the tracks were our biggest concern. Go over those too fast, and that could be game over for your suspension. And there's no one around to help you. So we took it slow, real slow, painfully slow, and there were so many of them. We questioned whether this route actually saved us time in the end. Oh well, it was certainly more of an adventure. We really enjoyed the solitude and peacefulness at the end of a long day's driving. But after a few days, we were ready for a change in scenery, and we were starting to wonder if there would ever be anything else around but the steppe. All of a sudden, the terrain began to change, and it was time for a little break before heading to the canyon. Wow. Getting to the end of the step and peeking over into the canyon was exhilarating. It felt like a fantasy land and we wanted to stay for a while. The catch is that this canyon is notorious for its wind, but it was forecasted to be mild, so after taking in the view, we set up camp. How could we pass up the opportunity to sleep in such an epic place?
What we'd learn about this area is that the wind forecast means nothing. <laughs> it can change quickly, and that's what happened here at 1 a.m. We reluctantly packed up and looked for another camp spot that was sheltered from the wind. Driving in the pitch black on dirt tracks is something we really avoid. A lot can go wrong, but sometimes you have no choice. After seeing the canyon from the top, it was time to see it from the bottom. The bottom of this canyon was once the floor of the ancient Tethys Ocean. Its water disappeared millions of years ago, but in our heads, we were driving at the bottom of an ocean. If you're lucky, fossils and shark's teeth can still be found here, and we were lucky enough to find these. To be honest, we did not expect it to be so spectacular down here. Our sleepless night quickly became a distant memory. And as we got closer to the rock formations, we were blown away as we looked up to see the two sisters towering over us. Last night was the second time we've had to move the tent. We looked at all the weather and chose the best time to come here, the calmest day. Maximum wind speed was supposed to be around about 15 miles an hour. Uh, we were on a ridge on the edge of a canyon, so you are asking for a little bit of trouble, I guess. But my guess would be at least 45, maybe even 50 miles an hour. So uh, the kids were fine, but Myself and Leah couldn't sleep, so 1 a.m. packed up the tent again. And we only drove about 5k inland and it made all the difference. We've had to switch up our plans a little bit because of the wind. When we looked at the weather initially before coming here, um, it, it wasn't going to be as extreme <laughs> in the canyons, but that's okay. Uh, we are, we've just rejigged things and we should be able to see and do everything we want, um, just a little bit differently. After a long lunch, it was time to find a camp spot. This is the area where we had to pack up the tent in the middle of the night and move. <laughs> so, we were right up at the top there. I, I don't know, I'm a little bit hesitant to camp in this area period, but um, I don't know. We, we just have to get there and get out and see what the, the status is. It's all a bit of a risk, but Maybe you know, fun. that's that's what it's about. That's what adventure is about, is not knowing what's going to happen. That's what makes it fun. So we'll see. Maybe around there. We learned our lesson from the night before and chose a big barrier to block the wind. Seeing the same landscape from below gave us a totally different perspective. It's interesting how two different people could be looking at the same thing but have two totally different views. It reminded me of the story with the blind men that go to touch an elephant for the first time. Each of them touch a different part of the elephant, and afterwards they begin to argue about what an elephant is like. Each perspective held some truth but by bringing their ideas together, they were able to gain greater insights into what an elephant is like. It got us talking about how travel has been a big part of exposing us to different perspectives. It forces you to challenge your own beliefs and assumptions through the lens of others. It's a reminder to be humble about what we think we know. Overall, travel has broadened our minds and expanded our horizons. And it's one of the reasons we love it so much. After breakfast, we headed to an area that has been described as the Painted Desert. We knew someone had taken a 30 kilometer shortcut to the Painted Desert a few years ago, but we had no idea where that shortcut was. We took our best guess using all the offline mapping apps we have. The thing is, in areas with wild weather like this desert, even though a track is on the map, 
You don't actually know the state of it until you drive it. It's very possible you get to a point where the track just totally disappears or it's so badly destroyed that you can no longer continue on it. Sometimes you just have to go for it and know you may have to turn around. For us, the potential savings on time and fuel was worth the risk. We knew the risk had paid off when we started to see what looked like little chocolate volcanoes popping up from the desert step. We've been really lucky with the wind the last few nights. Um, it hasn't been strong at all. And so we've enjoyed uh, the little cove canyon that we were in, but it's starting to pick up again. We've been driving around trying to decide where to park to try to avoid the wind so that we're not getting up at 1 a.m. to move the car. And um, hopefully we found a spot. We're just trying to use nature nature's natural barriers to the best of our ability but you have to be a bit careful about the venturi effect basically how a wing works and canyons can actually accelerate the wind and if you're too far away from the hill that you're using as protection that as well will accelerate the wind into your tent so we're as close as possible and hoping that it will hit fast and just go over our tent and then speed up the other side so that's the plan we just doing the best that we can do yeah um but this is a fun play area but it can get pretty wild pretty quickly and the wind is forecast to swing so we're planning on that so at the moment it is a little bit windy but hopefully throughout the night it will swing into our favor so we shall see if you see us moving again it clearly didn't <laughs> <laughs> Our forced move would bring us to a camp spot that would yet again surprise us with its unique beauty. We stayed here a few days because we loved it so much, and now we understood why they called it the Painted Desert.
So I've just come back from uh, talking to a guy called Timur and his team. They're a group of Kazakh guides out here in the deserts. And I met his brother a couple of hours previous and he said, look, my brother's going to be passing through here and he's the guy you want to talk to. So once all the kids were fed and in bed and Lyra joined them, I went over to say hello and he said, uh, oh, I've been expecting you. He said, I hear you want some information. Now, on these kind of trips, I try and do as much research as, as possible, but local uh, information on the ground, especially up to date, is invaluable and it should definitely be part of the mix import when making any sort of plan. And so I, he invited me into his car, jumped into the driver's seat, the main screen powered up and this like Russian map starts downloading. It's a topographical map and he just looks at me and he's like, this is how you navigate the deserts of Kazakhstan. I felt like I was in a film. Uh, ultimately, what I was looking for was some GPS coordinates so that we could attempt a shortcut. He advised very strongly about not taking this route. He said there's huge sand dunes, there's, it's ever-changing, there's all sorts of crisscrosses of tracks. He said you can get in a whole world of hurt, especially on your own. Um, and so he kind of showed me another route and he gave me his number and he said, any help that you need, even though we're both going to be kind of in and out of signal, feel free to contact me. And um, yeah, we kind of left it at that. But it was just a nice small experience that I'll always remember. And I love these kind of experiences. And I love that people are just willing to share information and help each other out. And, you know, regardless of wherever you are in the world, there's always be good people like this with good hearts that are just happy to help. Following the advice from Timor, we did not take the shortcut to the salt flats because if we had to turn around, we would have been too tight for fuel. But that still didn't make it easy to get to. There are no signs and tracks are crisscrossing in all directions. Eventually, we made it down to the salt flats and looked for a place to camp for the night, which you'll be surprised to hear would shield us from the wind. We may have found a place in an arch, kind of cool. And Matt's currently backing up into the spot where we're gonna to stay tonight. Hopefully the wind won't be too crazy. Our time in the Mangostau Desert was coming to a close. It was filled with uncertainty, challenges, and some of the most incredible landscapes on earth. All the ingredients for an epic adventure. hot isn't it you two are yeah. sat in your nappies it's uh it's 7 p.m here and 36 degrees the sun is still shining very brightly and it will till uh past 9 p.m and we're about to eat dinner now and we've had a pretty chill day here thank god we've got an awning and a, and a tent to hang out in otherwise it's just and enough unbearable, water. Unbearable here. Yeah. And enough water is drinking liters okay, and liters. You okay, Charlotte? There's no one around. Beautiful weather. The weather is supposed to turn, which is actually. Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> you got something to say, Jack? Charlotte, Charlotte, no more, please. Charlotte, chew your food. Chew your food. Yeah. Chew, chew, chew. Charlotte likes to stuff as much food as she can in her mouth, and then she can't chew it properly. <laughs> Do you remember? 
تبع ماذا Having young children definitely takes up a lot of time and energy. And then you add in a trip around the world, in a tent, in wild places, while making these videos, it can be a lot. <laughs> and if we let it all take over, there is no time for us to connect. So we have made a point to schedule in evening tea dates together, where it's just us, the stars, and a soothing cup of tea. And it is lovely.